Um, I'd firstly like to thank the State Library of Victoria, the Print Council of Australia, who are celebrating their 50th anniversary, and Monash University uh, Art, Design and Architecture, uh, for whom I work, if you'll excuse my bad grammar. My name's Marion Crawford, and I'm a lecturer at um, Monash Art, Design and Architecture. I'm the treasurer of the Print Council. I'm their committee member. And I'm a big fan of the State Library of Victoria. Uh, the Print Council is a not-for-profit organisation and we're celebrating our 50th birthday this year. So this event represents the Print Council's ongoing engagement with the culture of printmaking and with the State Library of Victoria. Um, it's wonderful to be able to work with the State Library to present this event. It's the second uh, of these events that we've presented. And I'd like to thank Susie Gasper for her wonderful organisational skills. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the Print Council's extensive archive of print commissions, and we commission a print from wonderful artists every year, uh, and, it's, and we've done so for 50 years, uh, that archive is now housed here in the library and we're extremely happy to know that it will be well looked after and we're happy that this wonderful history of engagement with print culture that these prints represent will be preserved in this wonderful um, organisation. And for those of you here who'd like to see some of those works, um, they are exhibited in the Mirror of the World exhibition, which is here in the library at the Dome, um, uh, up on the fourth floor. Um, and they, they're works that are drawn from the archive, and they also celebrate our 50, the Print Council of Australia's 50th anniversary. They're shown in the context of the exhibition um, that celebrates the history of the book, curated by the library's Des Cowley and Claire Williamson. Um, I'd also encourage you, if you want to learn more about the Print Council, to have a chat to Marguerite Brown, our wonderful general manager, who's down at the back of the building, or the building, the room. Um, and she can talk to you more about the print commissioning program. Um, so perhaps you'd be interested in subscribing to our imprint magazine and becoming a member of the Print Council. I've had some uh, wonderful helpers here today. Carolyn Fraser, who um, I'll hand over to her in a minute. Um, Richard Harding and Andrew Gunnell, who work at RMIT. And if you'd like to see some of our works as artists, they're currently in an exhibition next door at RMIT Gallery. Um, Rosalind Atkins, my wonderful colleague and artist. Um, Greg Harrison from MARDA, a wonderful typesetter and the most patient man in the world. Um, Gracia Harvey and Louise Jennison, lovely artists were here, and also Francesca Sassnitis, and you'll be hearing from her a little bit later as well. So it's a really great team of artists, printmakers, um, who've helped us today. Uh, so I, I lecture in fine art, contemporary fine art, at Monash Art Design and Architecture, and my most insistent, I've realised, and persistent fascination with fine art is centred around the printed image. And this includes the fine art print, the printed page, the relationship between text and image on the printed page, which then extends all the way into the book and literary studies and from there to poetry and writing. Alberto Manguel's insightful book that was given to me as a gift by my dear friend Francesca uh, is called The Library at Night and he explores the manifold characteristics of the habit of collecting and owning books that sometimes becomes known as the library. So he comments, and I'll quote him here, knowledge lies not in the accumulation of texts or information, nor in the object of the book itself, but in the experience rescued from the page and transformed again into experience in the reader's own being. And I think that's what we've experienced today in our wonderful workshop, um, where we've asked, uh, we've seen our poetry set in type and printed and experienced that folding and unfolding, doing and undoing, that is the experience of printing type. And printmaking itself, um, I argue, is a, 
as a fine art practice is a really sociable sort of activity. And you can observe this in the way a printmaking studio runs. And also, you know, we've all shared the equipment today and we, you know, we give each other practical tips on how to make things. But the printed image itself is also sociable. Um, and it's sociable in more ways than one. If we addition a print, it's a singular thing, there's only one of them. You know, a print is, there's one print, one image on a piece of paper. But we can also share that as we addition it and multiply it beyond its singularity. And this is what, what we've done here today at the State Library. And this, these are the two ways that the print, for me, is a really sociable creature. We've also printed a page from a collaborative project uh, called Unstable Edge that was made by me and a poet, Francesca Sassanitis. And this project, when we worked together, resulted in a hand-printed booklet that you'll be able to sit down on the last table there, and perhaps some of you have seen it already. Um, and it was exhibited in the exhibition, The Unstable Image, at the South Australian School of Art Gallery, the University of South Australia in Adelaide. So it's a well-travelled little booklet. Um, I've been working in my own research um, on a project titled Barnaba Ocean, Picturing the Island. And this project reconstructs my own history with a central Pacific island called Barnaba which is part of the island nation of Kiribati. And my project is investigating the impact of climate change um, in Kiribati using various ways of making visual images. And the image on the cover of the little publication that we made together um, is a photograph that was taken, I think, by my mother. And the person floating in the rock pool in that image uh, on Ocean Island. Uh, the rock pool was on Ocean Island and that image uh, is of me when I was about eight. I showed this image to Francesca and she's responded with her beautiful text. So um, you'll be hearing a bit more about that a bit later. Um, I, um, I'd like now though, and I hope that those uh, contextualising remarks give you the background for our project here today and um, I thank you once again for coming but I'd like to now introduce you to Carolyn Fraser who's exhibitions curator here at the State Library of Victoria. She's founder of Idlewild Press and she is um, an esteemed expert and teacher of everything letterpress. In fact she taught me how to uh, set type and she's going to talk to us about the history of small presses and the late 19th century development of tabletop presses, little Adanas, as we see over there on those tables, and how they gave rise to an amateur journalism fad among teenagers in the United States. So it's great to hear this history of the activity that we um, undertook today. Thank you. Um, just following on from Marianne's um, comment about the sociability and the collaborative nature of this kind of printing, um, it made me glad when you said that because I was a little bit concerned that what I was going to talk about was not related to um, what we're really here for, which is about poetry and printing poetry. But I do think that that is a key element that connects what I'm about to talk about. And why I wanted to talk about it was because I think a lot of times people see these presses and wonder about them, um, tabletop presses. Um, they're quite strange. They're clearly not um, all that useful as in industrial processes. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about the history of them. Um, the presses that we use today, the three Adanas, are English-made presses. And Adana managed to keep on uh, producing these presses a lot longer than many other companies did. Um, the presses that I'm going to talk about um, just now are pred predominantly American uh, presses. But if you imagine them in your mind's eye while I'm talking, they pretty much look exactly like the Adanas, sometimes a little bit smaller and sometimes a bit bigger. Um, 
Thomas Edison was known as the, the wizard of Menlo Park, and he um, ended up being the holder of 1,093 US patents. And he was also, however, a boy printer. And uh, he was employed as a teenager uh, to sell dime novels, magazines, fruit and candy on the Grand Trunk Railroad between Port Huron and Detroit. And he busied himself um, during downtimes um, on the train um, in his mini laboratory slash print shop, which he'd set up in the baggage compartment of the train. And among his stores of chemicals and telegraph equipment, um, Edison edited and printed what he called the, the Grand Trunk Herald on a hand lever press, just like these little Adanas. Um, and he sold subscriptions to uh, passengers on the train. Um, the Herald's tenure on the train, however, came to an abrupt end when a bottle of phosphorus, um, which was part of his scientific activities on the train, um, smashed to the floor and set the rail car on fire. Um, 1867 marks the beginning of what's considered the golden age of amateur journalism in the US. And Benjamin O. Woods of Boston offered a, what he called a novelty press for sale. And he advertised this in journals that were marketed to young people. Uh, the press sold for a few dollars and uh, local old printing hands were happy to hand over their hell boxes to budding printers. The hell box is really just all the type that's too worn or has been, um, you know, pied, um, fallen in its galley and just gets thrown into a box. Uh, news of amateur presses was, was reported in journals such as Oliver Optics magazine and prompted amateur journalists to make contact with each other and to, ex to exchange publications and they compared and competed over content, form and craftsmanship. In 1876, the efforts of 12 amateur printers saw the organisation of the first convention of the National Amateur Press Association, which still exists today. And it was held in Philadelphia on the 4th of July to coincide with the city's centennial exposition. 65 amateur journalists attended. A display of toy and novelty presses at the exposition was thought to inspire a surge of interest in the hobby. A second great wave of, um, of interest in amateur journalism co occurred in the 1930s when the Kelsey Company advertised small, inexpensive presses extensively in boys' life type magazines. As a hobby, amateur journalism was well established by this time. Local groups existed in every state and the annual conventions moved around the country. Within journalism and the printing trades, a history as a boy printer was seen as a badge of honor. Former boy printers often continued publishing amateur journalism while conducting their professional adult careers. Publications might last for a single issue or a season. A run of five to six years placed the amateur journalist in a pantheon of greats. It's unsurprising to learn that manager, many amateur journalists and hob hobbyists became important figures in political and intellectual life. Rare today is the use of the word hobby other than pejoratively. People have projects these days. The pursuit of pleasure has been supplanted in almost every area of life by economic imperatives. We might be witnessing the very last generation of amateur printage slash journalists, but the influence of their activity has, been, has always been vast. Experimentation breeds expertise and amateurism breeds passion. The word amateur comes from the Latin amateur, lover. And this is what lasts, that which we love. And I would say that our culture depends on it. Thank you. I'd like to, um, Francesca will now um, speak about our project a little bit. Uh, and then we'll proceed to read some of the wonderful poems uh, and the Unstable Edge poem um, later. Thanks, Marion. Um, you'll have to excuse me, people. I've managed to acquire a cold in the last few days, so 
my voice isn't the best, but I wanted to speak also a little about collaboration because my practice is now mainly in writing, but I started off going to art school as well, so I love image. And my practice is about the dialogue between image and text. And the great thing, of course, for a writer and for most artists is that we basically work in a vacuum and alone. And to have that opportunity to collaborate with someone is such a delight. So um, the first collaboration that Marion and I made was, as she said last year, which was the printed page, um, which was based around the idea of Marion's work and interest in um, the destruction of culture. So we began talking about um, ISIS and the great monuments that had been destroyed in the Middle East. And um, so in the end, uh, that's what that poem was about. And also the images were a kind of homage to the notion of the palimpsest, the ancient texts which are written over and over and the page turned, I made a kind of digital version of. Um, then this year uh, we had, oh, Marion invited me very kindly to join her um, for the unstable image. And again, we started talking about um, the idea of cultural destruction. And then, and you know, we would send each other articles and, and photographs. And the other, the other thing I'm interested in also, and Marion as well, is um, the idea of um, mourning practices and grieving practices and how um, we are able to express those emotions through various artistic forms and to understand family and um, relationship as well. And I suppose really in a, in a way, arbitrarily, Marion sent me that beautiful image of her in the, the coral pool. And immediately, for me, it sparked uh, a, a totally different sense of where we were going. And I began to think about not cultural erosion so much as, er, as islands and the erosion that occurs, um, uh, environmental e erosion as well, and a kind of excavation that we have to do in order to unearth our memories and our understanding of family relationships. Um, and of course today we've had the opportunity of putting together another kind of work which um, is composed of 15 small poems by 15 different people who had the opportunity to set their words today and have that wonderful feeling of, of actually seeing their words printed on the page. So in a minute, I'm going to call on Marion to read a few poems from our little publication today, and then I'll read a few more. Um, but before we go on to that, if you can bear with me, I will read um, from the words, actually, from Unstable Edge. Before I do that, I should just say that Marion sent me the image, but then she also talked to me about um, growing up on Kiribati, yeah? Barnabas, sorry on the island and, and what an interesting sort of childhood that must have been. And it set my mind to thinking about the waves and being on those islands. And so we would speak and then I would steal words from Marianne's mouth and put them into my kind of crucible, I suppose. So. This is literally what she said. 
you say, I wish I were floating still. And you are in the timeless place they call childhood, a photograph. Look, there you are, a red dot floating in the middle of the blue, in defiance of land, as if you were alone. Still, someone was taking the photograph. The past draws you. In collusion with land, thoughts as heavy as concrete. Leave seaweed stranded in the wake of tides, where seagulls pitch on wind-beaten wings, salt stings. My mother, you say, the island, the sea, define the shore where old ends and new begins, where the iron lung of the sea breathes back and forth. Cliffs crumble over millennia into the sea. Waves settle solid as, ro as rock. The island shifts on its foundations or the wind tilts the frame. A photograph. Thanks. Marion, would you like to read some of these? So we're not going to read all of them, but just a few. Dawn cracks the shell of night, sun spills, yolk bright. Oh, and the authors are on the back. That was Melinda Denham. Thank you, Melinda. <laughs> Vibrations radiate surrounding air, drawing bow across the strings. Oh, how my heart sings. From Julianne de Silva. Autumn, Dutch meddler ablaze, birds feast on its fruit. From Sandra Green. And I'll just read one more. Longer ways to go, the road lies before our feet, fading paths beneath. From Fiona Lewis. Thanks. I think they're really amazing. Like I was so impressed with everyone today. Um, I really liked this one actually. I think that's why Marion left it for me. <laughs> um, I am bone tired of this dance, arm in arm in arm in arm, held still and held. I think I like it because I want to have written it myself really. Um, <laughs> This is nice too. With dreams and sh oh, sorry, I should say who that's by. Uh, whoops. Yes, I am bone tired was by Sandra Dunstan. With dream and shadow, I sketched the lines of your hands and face, and that one was by Rachel um, Nodge. Shiny leaves shimmer, wind nudges gently swaying tree, earthbound roots steady. But that was by, gosh, I can't read, Trudy Stott. I'm, I was just really impressed with how many people made um, a supreme effort to do like proper five, seven, five syllable haikus. It was very, it's not easy. Filtered through leaves, sun beaming down on me, even the grass is happy. That one was by Casey Sherman. And this is quite a nice little one. Why? Such a little word, you might say, big on possibilities. Susan Weston. 
I think that's, yeah. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to my lovely trio of triplet Adana presses. <laughs>